Hello, everyone, and welcome to Curzon Living Room, a new series of discussions with contemporary filmmakers from all around the world, brought to you by Curzon Home Cinema. Um, this and subsequent Q&As will be live streamed simultaneously to Curzon's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter channels where you can watch along. You can also send your questions through to us, um, and we'll ask those questions as we go through the discussion just comment on the live video posts of each conversation. And when you write your question, please use the hashtag at Curzon Living Room. Also let us know where you, uh, your location is and we'll hopefully be able to get through all the questions. I'm delighted to welcome as the first guest of Curzon Living Room, the writer and director of System Crasher, Nora Fingshai. Hi, Nora. Hi, hello, how are you? Good evening. I'm very well, how are you? Very well as well, thank you. So I gather your living room at the moment is in Vancouver <laughs> yeah. where you're working or well you probably stopped working on a current project. Yeah that's true. I mean we continue working but in the editing room so the uh, filming stopped and yes I'm in Vancouver right now. So the film we're here to talk about, which many people will have just watched, System Crasher, premiered at the Berlin Film Festival last year, where it won the Alfred Bauer Prize. Since then, it's traveled to lots of festivals around the world with great success. And I'm, I'm curious to know about the impact the film has had internationally, but I guess we should really start with the genesis of the project, which I gather was, um, it sort of partly came about with a documentary that you've been working on a couple of years before. Yes, so it has a very long uh, backstory, this project. So basically, the, the idea to write the script came when we were shooting a documentary about a shelter home for homeless women in Germany. Um, and I was studying fiction directing by that time. So my roots come from fiction filmmaking. And then after several years, I kind of sneaked out to the documentary genre. And we were pottering this house for one year. And one day, a 14 year old girl moved into this institution which was shocking for me because it was a very, um, very sad place, almost like a dead end of life where you don't want to end up too soon. And then a teenager living in that kind of place. So I asked the social worker, what's a 14 year old girl doing here? And she said, oh, it's the system crashers. We can always take them in on their 14th birthday because no institution in the whole country dares to take that girl in. So that was the first time that I heard that term which in German even means system blow up, like it's a very violent word, but also very powerful at the same time. So that was the very beginning. I also gather that um, the story is partly inspired by your own youth. I'd, I'd reckon one interview. Yeah, I mean, let's say the whole motivation to write about a very hyperactive child definitely has to do with my own childhood. but. My work, like my world um, circumstances were very different to system crasher ones. So, you know, I didn't have to take any medication. We had a garden, you know, I had a place to run around. But I do remember how it feels to get on the nerves of every adult around you and to be a child that's all, sometimes just too much for the people <laughs> around or for the teachers, you know, I do remember that very well. Um, I do have a question that's come in from Adrienne, who is living in Leytonstone. Um, she jumped in head first and asked, could you talk about the decision to end the film the oh, way yes. you did? Of course. Um, of course. And that's also a good question. Um, so to write a film about a, a child that which only has the consistent of change, 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 you know, I mean, that was kind of the challenge to write the script also leads to the question how to end this film because it is about this visual circle that it goes on and on. So there were a few discussions that we had. One was, of course, she comes to the next children home in Germany, which has a better pedagogical concept, which would be realistic, ideally positively realistic, but for a cinema audience, it would feel like it's going on and on because it's hard to distinguish. It would have been the next institution. So then, of course, we did some research about sending kids abroad, which happens a lot. Last year, they sent a nine-year-old to Tanzania, I think. And it's a concept that, of course, is discussed a lot because sometimes it doesn't end very well when you send a kid to Spain, for example, and then it gets thrown out of that um, 
let's say of that farm again and then suddenly you have a child that's stuck in Spain or a teenager that ends up in a Siberian prison you know these cases had occurred and for us it seemed very absurd to let Benny go to Kenya so we decided to have that ending and for a long time in the script the ending was she disappears behind the passport control and then I had a very good um, kind of directing mentor um, Andreas Dresen a German director who read the script and he said Nora you cannot end, you cannot call a film name a film system crasher and then just end it with her disappearing the passport control like where's the energy of Benny so I thought good point and I was writing an ending where she breaks out again in the in the airport and then she runs and the whole airport runs after her and she flies away instead of the plane and it read quite well unfortunately we were such a low budget production that first of all we couldn't afford any extras so we had I think like 24 people that we could bring into the airport and then we tried to convince people to help us and run but of course they had to go to, and get there and catch their planes. So it doesn't really look like the whole airport is running behind her. And of course we couldn't animate her to fly away because that's very expensive. So we thought we make a freeze frame and she flies away, but that led to 100% of the test audience thinking she commits suicide, which of course was not my intention at all. I could have never let Benny die. So then we started experimenting and in the end we found a solution where we said okay let's do a reference to the beginning where she crashes the glass and in the end she almost she crashes the screen. So that's what it means for me but I, I, until now I think I, I've heard maybe 15 different interpretations of the ending and I found that none of them is right or wrong. Everybody sees her or his own truth. And in my truth, she survives. I think what's kind of interesting the first time I saw it, um, it just that the idea of the freeze frame coming in like that, it just took me back to watching Francois Truffaut's The 400 Blows and you've got Antoine on the beach. And yes. you, it's, there's something lovely about that ambiguity and it's leaving it to the audience to decide for themselves what they want the ending to be. Yes, and also I figure that there are big like cultural differences of how the ending um, is, is, is received. For example, in Germany, still I would say 50% of the audience reads it as a, or understands it as a clear suicide. Yeah. Whereas for example, when I did, I think two Q and A's in London, and I would say like 10 or 15% only understood it as a, as a suicide which is super interesting for me, you know, I think in Germany, people think very logically, like, well, but she runs up the stairs and then she is in a certain height. So if she then jumps down, she must at least hurt herself so that she cannot go to Kenya anymore. Whereas in, in, in other countries, it's much more kind of, um, how to say, uh, metaphoric, you yeah. know, the, the openness of understanding the reason, but anyway, nothing is right or wrong, it's all fine. Perhaps London audiences are just very optimistic about life. I hope so. Maybe not the way we push. <laughs> it seems like yeah. um, I do have another question from Emily Gunn, who's also from London. Um, and she would love you to talk about how the role of Benny was actually cast. Uh, pardon me, can you say that again? How the role of Benny was cast. Ah, oh yeah, good question. So, um, I mean, obviously I was very scared before that casting process because I was writing the script for about four years, a period of writing and researching. And I thought uh, we're never gonna find a girl who can play that role. So we started one year before shooting, which for kids is way too early because they change so much within one year. But anyways, we started one year earlier because I was so scared that we're ne never gonna find a girl, especially not in a children's casting agency. And we did a first round, first round in Helena was girl number seven. And I thought that it can't be that easy. So we continued looking for girls. And I think we casted 150 more girls until finally we made the decision, which now looking backwards seems so clear and obvious. But in the end, we were very, very lucky. And then we worked and we prepared the role six months with her. Yeah. So. Was... Helena, what you thought 
Benny would look like when you originally envisaged the character? Oh, not at all. <laughs> so, so, so writing the script, I always had like this skinny, brown haired little girl in mind. And then suddenly, you know, Helena with her, with her super blonde hair and almost like translucent skin um, was completely different than I ever imagined, but it has a great, like she has such a great cinematic quality and she can shift between like angel-like and evil. So you're, it's, it's just, uh, yeah, we were very lucky. It's also, it's, it, it's trying to find a character that, or an actor to play a character that audiences might be frustrated at times with, but they ultimately have to have a huge amount of empathy for. And, yes. and manages to do that really, really well. Yes. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's, it, I think this particular question about empathy and being appalled, um, that was something that was always accompanying us as well in the script writing process, as well when we shot the film, as well in the editing. Like in, in we shot, I think, three more scenes where she freaks out and we took them out because it was just too much. There was a point where you like, I, I can't anymore, you know? So we had to kind of take that back a little bit. And what was the process of actually filming like? Obviously, I know in, in Germany, like in many countries, there are restrictions on the amount of time you can film with children. And she, you know, she's in every scene, it's pretty tough. Yeah, so she was nine when we shot the film and you're allowed to work five hours uh, plus a lunch break. So it was like almost six hours that we had her on set every day. And we filmed about 70 days, so for five months, um, including a long break for Christmas and New Year's Eve. So that was very, a long period of time. And we always um, rehearsed the evening before. So first of all, Helena, even before coming to the second round of casting, she had read the script together with her mom. So she knew exactly what would happen. And she had a lot of, a lot of questions. And then we had the six months preparation where she was part of casting all the adults. So um, always when I found an actress or an actor who was my favorite for another role, then he or she could play with Helena. So I could see how their energy works together, but also she slowly understood Benny's universe. And we would always make those lists, like how does Helena react now? How would Benny react to make sure she never confuses the two characters, almost the opposite as you work with adults where you try and find the, you know, what do you have in common with the character and how can you make the character your own in this way? We, I always work with her on the separation to make sure she never confuses herself and Benny and she never takes Benny home. So yes, that was the process. Um, I've, I've got another question here from uh, Claire Vaughan. She asks about the rehearsal um, process that you just talked about, but another element to a question is about storyboarding. Did you do any storyboarding at all in advance? No, not really. So our, um, our director of photography, uh, Roy Yunus Ima, um, we worked together on quite a few projects, also together with our composer and the editor. So we're kind of a bunch of a group of friends who likes to work together and try very different genres and styles of filmmaking. And he also filmed the, um, all the castings. So through that casting process, we already found a certain aesthetic, how to film Helena, especially. And we did a lot of color tests, like which color make her stronger, which colors make her very pale, which colors take her uh, energy completely away. So for example, when she's in the psychiatry ward, she wears kind of this light turquoise color. And when she has a lot of power, she wears pink. And after she met her mom, she always wears red because the red interestingly makes her really pale. Whereas the orange and the yellow or the pink especially empowers her. So it was really color concept. We tried to fit to Helena. So this was our visual preparation more than an actual storyboard. We did have some floor plans or rough shot lists, but then in the end you have like six hours and nine year old. So you, 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 you throw it all away and you just uh, go and film it. Um, just staying with the idea of color, you've got these two quite stunning expressionistic moments in the film where characters touch her face. Um, and 
it, it, it was funny watching it the first time that you said, uh, thinking of another movie, Alfred Hitchcock's Marnie, where suddenly she sees red and the entire screen fills up with red. Um, I'm, I'm curious when you place that next to the rest of the film, which has a very, at times, documentary feel, um, the, the decision process that you went to to include those moments and how early on did you decide that you would represent uh, those moments in that way? So they were always in the script, but written in a very, very bad and obvious way. So in the script, it was always like she's in that well and the walls melt and suddenly black liquid comes over her and it was really horrible. And my, uh, the, the, the screenplay was um, written when I was still in film school. At some point, this film was supposed to be my um, thesis film. So all my teachers were saying like, please take, take that out of the script. And I was saying like, I know it reads horrible, but let's leave it in as a stand in. And then we don't have money for wells and liquids and melting walls anyway, but it reminds us to film a little bit something more abstract because we try to find um, images that represent the inner world of Benny and not just have the super hyper-realistic documentary like um, social drama. So that was very important. So always when Helena left the set after five hours and 45 minutes, we were left alone and we had some, you know, lenses and things to experiment with. And our DOP, he always brought really like strange things like big glass blocks or jelly, you know. And, and then we, we experimented really like in the old times with very cheap film tricks. When you go with a super long lens and you film like this cheap plastic lens and you switch the color and we created hours and hours of this footage. And in the end, it's an editing masterpiece that our editor found a way throughout a period of eight months to make that merge together that it doesn't look as trashy <laughs> anymore as it looked once, yes. I've got a question from Mark, who's also from London, saying he adored the film. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously Benny has to go to some dark places in terms of her language and actions. Um, you've mentioned a little bit uh, about her mum being involved, but how involved were you with um, Helene's parents in discussing everything? So very involved from the very beginning. So luckily we had a long, long time of preparation. And even before we agreed to work together, I met with her mom. And of course, the first question that her mom asked me, like, how are you going to cope with this? Like, because Helena in real life is a very, so to say, healthy child. I mean, she has a horse and she's good in school and she does professional ice skating and she's very smart. I think what she does have in common with Benny is a hyper energy level, just not as destructive, of course. Um, so, uh, so I think when we shot the film, probably every day that I spoke to the mom, sometimes the mom was on set, sometimes the mom needed to work. So it was more because she lives with her mom. So the mom was very uh, essential in this process. Also to reflect and give feedback and say like, well, today she was really happy or today she was really tired. You know, it was a back and forth discussion always. I have a, a, another question, this time from Claude in West London. Um, he's interested in, in your own sort of uh, emotional reaction. Um, were there any moments during filming where, like Misha, you became quite heavily emotionally involved? Yes. Um, so um, as well in filming, but even more, I would say, in research, you know, so because I started from that first moment of having the idea until the script was ready was four years and I spent a lot of time in children homes in psychiatry wards in emergency shelters in school for a special school for kids and I had like about 60 to 100 interviews with people who work in the social sector so it was a very long time and and probably was too much you know probably I, I dove in like too deeply and I figure that it completely like it darkened my my view in the world um it was so shocking for me I also have a son myself like what parents sometimes do to their kids you know and then it's even more complicated to understand that the same parents sometimes love their children so um so yeah I totally it re I reached my limit and it, there was a time when I had to like make a break for one year and completely stop the research 
because I couldn't think about anything else than like horrible uh, scenarios. So um, that was maybe the first round. And then filming had different emotional challenges because of course I was very worried that Helena takes this as a positive experience and that we don't traumatize her while shooting this. So our approach of working together was always very playful. For example, when she freaks out completely, it was never me saying like, oh, now you freak out and you have to be super bad. It was almost the opposite. It's like, okay, show them what you can do. And she's like, yeah, but why should I show them that I'm so strong? Yeah, because they want to force you to go to school. So then she asked, why don't I want to go to school? Yeah, because the kids bully you. What do they do? They throw your things out the window. And then she was like, oh no, I don't want to go to school. And then you say, and you have superpowers because you're Benny. So no adult can force you to do anything. Stop, show them you have superpowers. And then she was like, all right, I'm going to show them. So this was, I tried to work with her as much as I can that way. We always also try to balance the days that when we had a very intense scene, for example, at home where she gets pushed into the closet, um, the next day we would film something very calm or something funny, something with Micha. So kind of try to keep the balance for the kid. And then also, of course, shooting with babies is emotionally very challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Not a recommendation for her, but you know, sometimes you have to. And then it's this very, very careful process to not traumatize the babies or the parents or, you know, or the team. So it's, it's tiptoeing. Yeah. There are two pivotal scenes um, for me in the film. Uh, one, the scene where Mika admits that he can't deal with it anymore, um, which I, I, I think is an incredibly powerful scene. And then we've got um, Sal from Hastings um, asking a question about the scene where Benny is uh, comforting uh, Mrs. Bamfler, and I'm just I'm just curious about your approach to both of those scenes, the breakdown and and this acknowledgement that that someone in a professional role just can't do the job. Yeah, I mean that's a that's an experience that I had um, talking to people. Like most of these scenes are in any form inspired from the real word. So from the real world that somebody was telling me about that happened to me or a lady who works in the social um, system, she told me once there was a birthday and, and this kid where she had taken care of had birthday and she had to sing the song and she just couldn't anymore and she started crying and then the little girl comforted her. So that's also, I mean, for me it was, first of all, when I heard about this moment, it was so emotional but I also thought it's important to show that, yes, those kids are definitely able to feel empathy. Yeah? They're not little monsters as they might seem on first sight. It's just very, very complicated, the relationship with their parents, with the system, you know. And um, in Germany, the system, of course, tries to help. But sometimes you have all those crazy rules of, oh, we're, we're not responsible right now. You have to take care of it. And we're not responsible. You have to take care of it. And what happens is that the kid gets traumatized by the system because it never can arrive at any place. There's always like breakups and breakups and breakups. Um, so, so this was one thing that was important. And then of course, I mean, in any institution I went to, I wanted to at least adopt three kids and bring them home, you know, and thinking like, oh, maybe I'm the one who can save those kids. So, um, and I think, people who work in the field really have to have the great ability of keeping a certain professional distance. I could never do that. Like I would just not be able to. And I have a great respect for people who can hold that balance because if you want to really change something and help those kids, you do need to find a connection. But at the same time, it can't be too close. Otherwise, you don't have a life on your own anymore and also not very healthy. Yeah. Also, it, it, it strikes me in a way that that's something you achieve with this film because what I find quite astonishing is that in one moment we are in the most subjective position of being in the worldview of Benny and in the next scene we're pulling far back and, and have this very objective view of what these care workers have to deal with. And mm. it's, it's fascinating how the film balances that and I can't imagine it was 
entirely easy to find that balance throughout the film. Yeah, it's, it was a lot of really tiptoeing and trying out. I mean, for me, it was very important that the system itself also gets a voice because that was my experience on research. When I heard the term the first time, I thought, oh, it's a bad system. Why don't have people more patience with kids like Benny? So I had a really clear judgment in my head. But then I went to my first research and I lived in the children's home for three weeks. And I found out, wow, I mean, I couldn't cope with being responsible for 10 kids now out of at the same time imagine you have 10 kids at home now you still have to do bureaucracy one kid has to go to the doctor three of them don't want to do their homework you know three others have like <laughs> a fight with each other so i mean try and do that job it was really impressive for me that i thought like i could never do that so from that moment on the concept of the screenplay already changed and i wanted to have the system have a voice and become human because every system also consists of the human that are part of the system. You've, um, I'm, I'm aware that we're quite close to the end of our time, but um, you mentioned earlier about the reaction in the UK when the film screened at the London Film Festival and different reactions elsewhere. I'm just curious about the professional reaction of, of people who work in this world to the film, particularly in Germany. And has there, I know the film was also uh, the um, German entry for the Academy Awards, but what was the reaction um, in Germany about what the film was saying? So very positive, surprisingly. And actually, I mean, no one, at least not from our film crew had ever expected that um, the film was was screened in the cinemas and it got like 600,000 um, admissions, which for German for German art house movies is, is, is massive. So, um, and a lot of the people who came to watch the films were people who actually work in that field, who said, finally, we see a film where we're not the bad guys, because usually what can happen easily is that you point the fingers on the system and then the people who are the bad ones who take the kid out of the family, you know? So I think like, yeah, I mean, I mean of course you always have people who say like, I see it differently. I think Micha is very unprofessional. I think like I, I have a different world view on the world, um, but um, I mean, that's normal, right? Um, I'm afraid we've come to the end of this event. System Crasher is now available to watch on Curzon Home Cinema, along with a whole wealth of new and classic titles from around the world. The next event um, of, of in this series will be on Tuesday night at 8.30, following a screening of Bait, if you want to watch that film. And the director of the film, Mark Jenkin, will be in conversation with Mark Commode. I'd like to thank 606 Distribution, who are the people who are um, releasing System Crasher in the UK. Also, thank you to Curzon and the producer of this event, Michael Garrett. Um, but most of all, I would very much like to thank Nora. Congratulations with the film and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone who watched the film. It was my very first uh, online Q&A ever in this forum and it was very very nice thank you so much well stay safe in Vancouver and stay safe everyone else thank you thank you <laughs>